Good morning once again, Paolo. As we move into this new month, this month of September, honestly, I had some trouble picking where we were going. And I uh, thought about a number of different things going back to the New Testament. I thought maybe we would look at the I am statements of Jesus in the book of John. I thought about picking another epistle. This time, maybe not one of the, the Apostle Paul, but perhaps Peter, or perhaps of John. And then, Reverend Hester came to me last week, and he said, that was such a good series you did on, on uh, Esther. I'd like you to continue so we hear the rest of the history. And I got to thinking, there's a lot in the next couple of books that we can discuss, that we can meditate upon, that though it was a story of old, it's applicable to us today. And so for the month of September, we're going to be in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And I want to begin, like I did with Esther, by giving you a little bit of context and a little bit of background on these books. Now, Ezra and Nehemiah in our Bible are two separate texts. They come right before the book of Esther. And uh, it's not chronological, though, so don't, don't bank on that. But in the Hebrew Bible, they're one. It's the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. There's no division. Of course, in the Hebrew scrolls, there are no chapters. We separate it for simplicity. But it is, it is meant to be one particular work. Because it is the work of God in restoring Jerusalem from start to finish. And remember, as we talked, this is during the exilic period. So, so recapping our history, Israel and Judah fell into sin, and God, though he had corrected them and corrected them and corrected them, finally decided to let them reap the rewards of their, of their sinfulness and their injustice, and he allows them to be captured and taken into exile. And so, around the year 587, Jerusalem, the city of God that was never to be destroyed, that would forever be a light shining on the hill, was brought to ruin. The walls were torn, the houses were destroyed, the temple itself was ground into just piles of boulders. And it was a day of great mourning for the people of the land. The smartest, the brightest, the youngest, the richest were all taken out of their homes and taken hundreds, if not thousands of miles east to the, to the capitals or to the cities of, of Babylon. And we have a number of books in this Bible that tell us of this experience. We read about Esther. Esther is one of them. The book of Daniel specifically gives us insight into what it was like to be a Jew in Babylon during the exile. We also have a lot of promises in that book about what God is going to do prophetically, what God's going to do in the future, and what God was doing for the people then. But then we have the promise of God from the prophet Jeremiah who you'll remember I said, he prophesied just as the city was about to be destroyed, and he promised the people, God is going to let this city fall, but he will bring you back in 70 years. And God is faithful to his word. Ezra opens with that promise being fulfilled. If you will, turn in your scriptures or look upon the screen, I want to look at Ezra chapter 1, just a, first, a few of the first few verses. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him also. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. This is the decree of Cyrus, king of Persia. This decree occurred in 400, excuse me, 538 B.C. 
just a few years shy of the 70 year mark. And this, the history behind this is Babylon ruled for many years. But at the end of the, of the book of Daniel, we see that scene where the handwriting of God was upon the wall and they knew Babylon was, was to be destroyed. Well, Persia sweeps in. Cyrus takes the throne. And as he is taking the throne, he finds that there are a number of prominent and powerful Jewish men who were part of the king of uh, Babylon's council. And somehow, we don't know how, we don't know when, but somehow they showed him the prophecies of old, specifically of the prophet Isaiah, who in the 44th and 45th chapter named Cyrus by name and said, Cyrus will be the servant of God who returns the Israelites home and rebuilds the temple. Now, the, the historical context of the chapter says that Cyrus was so moved when he read Isaiah and found that he was prophesied 300 years prior that he then proclaimed this statement that we just read. A heathen, an idolatrous worshiper, a man who, who had no concept of the true God is encountered or encounters reference of the true God, recognizes him, gives glory, and fulfills purpose of God. Talked last time in Esther about how God providentially uses all things. This is an example of that. So Cyrus sends the people home and in his statement you heard him say, if you are the children of these people of this God, the great God of heaven, go home. And if you can't go home, give money to those who can and go build your temple. Well, there was rejoicing in the land. And so the first wave of exiles goes. Now remember, Esther is later. This is long before Esther. So this was the first wave that I had mentioned. There will be multiple. So the first wave gets there, and they find the city in shambles. There are a few scattered inhabitants who are living in the city who, who have made clusters in the homes that still stood. But the city that was once a shining beacon to the landscape around them, the city where the temple was, where God himself dwelt, was now nothing more than piles and heaps of trash and rubbish. And they were overwhelmed. Now I want us to, if you will, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. To the um, let's see, 43rd chapter. I want us just to read a passage of encouragement from Isaiah. Now Isaiah preaches, he says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Remember not the former things. When these exiles come, the vast majority of them were born in exile. They didn't know what Jerusalem looked like. There were a few who, who made the journey well into their 70s and 80s. But when they returned to the city, either those that had once seen its splendor or the children who had heard their parents tell of the greatness of Jerusalem found a city that it was unrecognizable and their hearts plummeted to see the destruction thereof. But the prophet Isaiah, multiple times in his book, not just there, continually reminded the people, don't fixate on the past. Yes, there are glories of the past, but the glories of the past should point you to the fact that God is not done with glory. You may be in a moment, you may be in a valley, but when you're in the midst of a valley, recognize there are more mountaintops to climb. And this is what the people began to get perspective on. Yes, Jerusalem is destroyed, but if God has promised to rebuild the city, then he will. And what's to come is going to be magnificent, even though right now it looks difficult. Now, Don chided me for not wanting to read chapter 2 of Ezra. <laughs> you feel free to do so at home, but it's just a list of lots of names that we can't pronounce very well. Of all the people who came and all the stuff they brought. And praise be to God, y'all, um, you may have to read it in English. I had to read it in Hebrew. 
Praise the Lord. Uh, we, ben and I joked about that this morning. But if you will, turn to Ezra chapter 3. I want to look at you all to look at what happens after they arrive, after they get settled in, and they recognize that God has called them to a purpose in this demolished city. Ezra chapter 3. And when the seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. So for the vast majority of them, they lived in the countryside, in all the villages, and all the areas in Judah. Not in the capital itself. The capital was in ruins. But they come together. Then uh, Jeshua, the son of Josedach, and the brethren of the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shetithiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. For nearly 70 years this altar has laid in ruin. No sacrifices has gone, have gone before the Lord. So once the people are settled, once they gather together, the priests, those who return, and the governor, Zerubbabel, gather together and they make the priority. The first thing to do is rebuild the altar and worship. When we look at our broken cities around us, when we think about Winston and the trouble that it has and how there are pockets that do well and pockets that do bad and how there are places where people can't eat and places where there's crime, we know that there are shootings. Um, even, even in our own communities, just a few weeks ago out here on Main Street, there was a senseless murder. And we think to ourselves, what's wrong with our city? How can we fix it? Scripture tells us the first thing to do is begin with worship. Jerusalem had a crime problem because there was no industry. The few people who lived there, the only thing they could do was to steal from the people who came and passed by. Did they first start by instituting new laws and new, new police measures? No, they started with worship. Anyone who moved in the city would be vulnerable to attacks from, from passerbys outside. It was not uncommon for raiders to come into undefended cities. Did they build the wall? No. They worshipped. The temple itself wasn't built. The royal palace wasn't built. People didn't even have homes. And before they, they focused on any of those priorities, they started with worship. Because the leaders who had returned recognized that the first thing that had to be done was to bring God back into this broken community. And so, they worshipped. Now this was a far cry from what they had seen before. Once they had a, a splendid temple, coated in gold and silver and bronze, great marble uh, blocks held the, the roof in place. It was a glorious place to worship, and here they are out in the field, or out on, on top of a mountain, wherever they were, surrounded by rubble. But I tell you, the genuineness of their worship was more beautiful in the lack than it ever was in the abundance. And so, they worshiped. Verse 4, they also kept the Feast of the Tabernacles, which means that this first worship event would have happened in September or thereabouts. As it is written, and they offered the daily burnt offerings and the number required by the ordinance for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for the new moons and those of all the appointed feasts of the Lord that, that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a freewill offering to the Lord. From the first day to the seventh month, they began to offer offerings to God, although the foundation of the temple had not yet even been laid. They also gave money to the masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea and from Joppa according to the permission which they had from Cyrus the king. So what I see in this little passage is I see a people who are filled with hope and expectation and love for God. And even though where they are worshiping is not comfortable and where they are worshiping is not beautiful and where they are worshiping is not um, very immaculate. It is a place of genuine worship. And they institute all of the feasts. They do everything that the scripture said they should have been doing before they were cast out of Jerusalem. And their hearts are filled with gladness. 
Because it doesn't matter the building they're in, what matters is the God they love. These are people who have caught revival, and they are worshiping. And it is not a great multitude. It is not many, many thousands. It's just a small handful, a remnant, who came back. But their worship is strong, and it is powerful, and it's about to make a difference. And so what do they do? They give. They give to God out of what they have. Now, before you think this was an easy offering, remember, they've returned to a land that hasn't been kept in 70 years. They didn't have their, their cousin Jim Bob down there tending their flocks and keeping their vineyards. When they come home, 70 years of weeds and growth have taken over their farms. All what animals they might have had have been scattered and have gone into the wilderness. They're having to start from scratch. And so for them to keep the feast days and to give offerings every single day to God, and then on top of that, to then reach into their pockets and pull out what gold and silver they have and give that to God to buy materials to build the house. All of this is a great sacrifice. They could have used those oxen and those sheep and those gold coins to build their own homes, to repair their own farms, to buy new animals for their own livestock. And they could have been tempted to say, let's, let's turn a profit first. Let's get through one good season and next year we'll give God the tithe. We'll give God the offering. But instead they reached in and they reached in deep with joyful hearts and they gave abundantly. And so they rejoiced. But the scripture tells us, as we just read, the foundation was not yet laid. This is the year 538, and the people are happy. Now, in the second month of the second year of the coming of the house, excuse me, of their coming to the house of God of Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shetithiel, uh, Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, and the rest of the brethren of the priests, and all the Levites, all who had come out of the captivity, began work and appointed from the Levites from 20 years and above to oversee the work of the house of of the Lord. So a few months later, they let, they let the winter season pass by. They get to work and they get busy. Then Je uh, Jeshua, with the sons and his brother, uh, excuse me, with his sons and brothers, Cadmiel, with his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee the working of the house of God. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets. And the Levites, the son of Asaph, the symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house was laid. So another triumph has occurred. They cleared enough of the area of all the rubble to then begin to build the foundation. And they put the blocks on the ground and they leveled it and they made sure that it was prepared and ready for the temple that would soon rise and the people rejoiced when it was finally completed. Months worth of sweat and tears. Untold amounts of offerings went into buying this stone. All of them sacrificed and they could see the progress. But, Verse 12, but as many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the father's house, old men, had seen the first temple, they wept with a loud voice when the foundations of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy. Even in the midst of their rejoicing, though, there is still a tinge of sadness. Because there were some, some who had seen the former glory. And though they were, they were rejoicing that God was doing a new work, they still wept because it wasn't as grand as what God had once done. They remembered the Temple of Solomon. They remembered how large it was. And they looked at this new foundation and they knew this new temple would never compare. And their hearts wept and they became discouraged. They forgot what Isaiah said. He said, don't remember the former things because I'm about to do a new thing. Now, the younger folks and those who, who kept their eyes fixed on the good thing, they rejoiced because though they had heard the stories of old, 
They didn't have that point of comparison. And they rejoiced and they leapt and they said, God is doing something great with this new foundation. Praise be to God. We all have that temptation, don't we? Whether we're old or whether we're young, it's easy for us when we go through a hard time in life to look back and to see what God did in the past and to bemoan that right now or in our future, it doesn't seem the same. It's really easy to see with the church, especially a church like ours that's had its struggles. We're on the precipice of a new thing. If you haven't felt that, let me say it. We are on the precipice of a new work of God in this congregation. Part of that is through the initiative that Reverend Hester has brought on the Who's Your One. I haven't seen you all so energized in years. Not everyone has found your one yet, but many of you have come up to me and you said, this is the person I'm praying for. Or you said something such as, I'm praying every day that I find someone that I can share just a little good news with, or I can give a card to, or I can do something. You may not know one person that you're targeting, but you're asking God each day to let you impact one person. And it is catching, and I pray it continues to catch, because this is the precipice of a new thing. But it's tempting when we're starting to step into a new work of God to turn around and look back and say, you know, 20 years ago, this is what it was like, and it'll never be like that again, and oh, woe is us. Well, it's a good thing that things change. I know we don't like change, but it's a good thing they do. If God asked you to do the same work today that he did 45 years ago, most of you all would say, no, thank you, Lord. My body can't handle that. There are things that I did when I was 20 that I can't do anymore, and I'm still young enough not to complain. Amen? <laughs> the work of God changes. And just because it doesn't look the same as it used to does not mean that it is not as glorious as it was. You see, the, the, the priests who bemoaned this new temple, they were upset because it was smaller. But God had no intention of them having a grand, showy temple covered in gold and silver and bronze that would say to the nations, look how much money we spent on this building. He wanted a place that would be a house of prayer for all nations. You see, in the old days, the people rejoiced because the temple was beautiful. But in the new days, God wanted them to rejoice because He was beautiful. And this is a change. As we look through the rest of the, the book of Ezra, we find that the main difference between the worshipers of old and the worshipers of new is not where they worshipped, but how they worshipped. Ezra brings in revival in such a way that the people from that day until the day that Jesus comes, they're faithful to their scriptures, they're faithful to their readings, they're faithful to prayer. This is not something that could have been said of the generation before. Now we give the Pharisees some slack, and it's, it's or not slack, we give them some, some uh, criticism, and it's okay to do so because Jesus did as well. But you see, the Pharisees are an example of what comes out of this revival. Now, they become so concerned about ever sinning that they go overboard. But compare their religious zeal. They, loved, they wanted to love God so much that they added extra rules as compared to their, their ancestors who loved God so little that all it took was a passing by statue and they'd go fall down before it. Worship is about to change. For these people of Israel. And God is about to do a new thing that the eyes of men cannot comprehend. Why? Because the eyes of men look on the outside, but God looks on the heart. For us, we are entering a season of change. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if that means that our congregation is going to, to all of a sudden begin to explode in, in population. It may be that our demographic changes. Maybe the people who sit in this pew might become a little bit younger. Or maybe they might become a little bit darker. I don't know. It might be that we continue as we are, but the Lord gives us new opportunities to minister in this community. 
And while we still have life and breath, we're faithful to spread the gospel. It might be that God simply works individually and you all have a revival in your own personal ministries that you've never seen before. I don't know what God's plan is. I know He's laying the foundation and I know it's worth celebrating. And church, as we read these books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we see God rebuilding Rebuilding what was broken, rebuilding what was damaged, rebuilding what seemed hopeless into a glorious new work for Him. I encourage you all to partner and join with us. Whether it's building this church, rebuilding your families, rebuilding the ministry in your own life, God wants it to be glorious. And it begins just as this chapter began with genuine, heartfelt, submitted worship. Keep God center and focused, and as you do that, He will lead you into all other things. This morning, as we sing our invitational, I, I open this altar to anyone who doesn't feel close, that close and personal relation with God. Perhaps you, you know His name, you know the stories, you can tell other people about the goodness of grace, but there are days when you just feel like God is distant. This altar is open. You can come. You can ask the Lord to move on your part that you might know He is with you. If there is something in your life that you feel is broken and needs rebuilding, come and lay it before God and ask Him to take the broken pieces and restore them to something beautiful.